Hey, hello, hi, welcome to and are back to the Equitheory Podcast. I am your host, Jill Trees, and this week's episode, we are going to be answering a ton of patron questions, uh, six in fact, but some of them are quite lengthy. So if you guys aren't familiar with how this goes, I essentially have a Patreon where you guys can join to support the podcast and get your training questions answered right here. So, um, these people have pledged to support the podcast, uh, monetarily speaking, and they um, shoot me a question and then I answer it here to the best of my ability. So if you're interested in doing that, just join the Patreon, shoot me your training question, and we'll get into it. But be sure to let me know whether or not you want me to use or include your name and also what your preferred pronouns are so that, uh, you know, they don't offend anybody. Um, but yeah, so I think we're going to jump into it because this, this has the potential to be quite a long episode. So we're going to get into it. But first, you know, we got to roll the music and we got to do some, some ads. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Theory listeners, this is Tista and Charlotte of Heart Horse. We're two best friends who love horses just like you, but we know how hard it can be to connect to other equestrians and find the friendships we dreamed about when we were young, horse crazy kids. That's why we founded Heart Horse, a space to celebrate and support you on your horsemanship journey. Think of it as self care for equestrians. In the Heart Horse herd, you will fill yourself up so you can bring your best to your horse. You will explore how horses enrich your life and connect you to yourself, and you'll find authentic support from other horse lovers outside the noisy world of social media. We know that you're already taking amazing care of your horse, and we're here to make sure you're doing the same for yourself. Cowgirl up on your self-love by opting to receive our Heart Horse Box, a bi-monthly mailer curated for the heart-minded horse lover. Membership starts at just $20 a month. Go to hearthorse.us and use the code, all caps, EQUITHEORY for 25% off your first month of membership. Okay, guys, when you become a patron of the podcast by joining at patreon.com slash equitheory, you'll gain access to all kinds of opportunities to benefit you and your horse. Being an equitheory patron means that you're able to gain a like-minded community of progressive equestrians via our Discord server, ask your burning training questions, and have them answered on the podcast, live monthly Q&A Zoom events, and the option to schedule phone call consults with me to help you work through a behavioral or training-related issue, and at the very highest here, the option to submit up to 30 minutes of video per month for me to review and critique. You can break it up however you would like. So the Patreon is set up to accommodate budgets and you're free to cancel at any time penalty free. So become a patron of the podcast today. Help me and the horses and help yourself. Okay, here we go. And it's official, you know, that we're actually starting the episode now because my cats have started sprinting. But um, did you guys hear that? That 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 what I just did? That was the Patreon ad. Um, I did that separately from this episode. Yes, yes, you heard me correctly. I finally, <laughs> finally have a standard Patreon ad, which is probably annoying to you. Um, but you can fast forward through it if you are a patron or have already heard it. Um, actually, you know what? If you're not a patron and you've already heard it, then you don't get to fast forward through it. You have to listen to the whole thing. That's the new rule. Sorry, I don't make them. Um, <laughs> literally just made them. Um, but I am so proud of that ad because I wrote it out yesterday and then just a second ago, I just sat here and like zipped through it. One take. Like, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, let's let's get into these training questions. I mean, what else is there to do? I don't really think I have like very many updates. Um, I do want to say though, thank you everyone who reached out to me after the last episode on sharing your support and relating and everything like that. I just think this, this time of year especially is always a little bit difficult, but especially with the pandemic, it's just made everything a little bit two, tenfold, twofold, <laughs> all of the folds. Um, so, you know, we're all getting through it and it'll be, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for your kind words and thoughts. I'm hoping to get back, back going on everything. I'm just so, okay. Now we get to figure out how we make the watch quiet. I think I've done it perhaps. Um, how do I turn on do not disturb? 
until this evening. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just got an Apple Watch because <laughs> uh, I had a Fitbit that I got for Christmas. And then I was like, mm, I don't like that I can't respond to texts on it. And so I decided I would go ahead and spend the money for an Apple Watch. And oh my God, it changed my life. Because you guys with girl pockets, you know that it is impossible to get your phone with its pop socket on in and out of your pocket. Um, and I have the iPhone 11 Pro Max, I think. And it um, it makes it a little bit impossible <laughs> to get my phone out of my pocket. It always catches or is like fit in there perfectly. So having the watch and being able to respond to texts and stuff or decline calls is so nice, especially when I'm working with the horses. Sorry, this is not an ad for Apple <laughs> iWatches, but um, I just, that does what that sound was, but it's off now, I think. I hope. Fingers crossed. Anyway, let's get into these questions, okay? So question number one comes from patron Kate. She writes, first of all, I just want to say that I love your podcast and find it so helpful to hear someone else's journey on starting positive reinforcement. Followed you on Instagram for about four years, and it's awesome to see how far you've come in that time. Wow, Kate, thank you. <laughs> That's so nice. Um, I'm okay with you saying my name. Thank you for that. Okay, now the question. I have two horses that live in a back paddock at the facility where I board. One of the horses, Nate, is my hunter jumper that I ride three to four days a week. My other horse, TiVo, is 24 and essentially retired. He's very wary of people, so I do positive reinforcement work with him so that he can become more comfortable with being handled. However, when I take Nate down to the barn to ride him, which can't be seen from their paddock, TiVo gets very anxious, or Tevo. I hope it's TiVo. You know, I'm going to go with the, like, the inval. It's T-E-V-O. So I'm assuming the inval is making the, e you know, whatever, English. <laughs> um, he paces the fence the entire time Nate is gone. This is understandable because horses are herd animals. There's also a paddock nearby with horses he can see depending on where they are in the paddock, but this doesn't seem to reassure him all, at all. I know this is uh, kind of stress is bad for a horse mentally and physically. Aside from getting another horse or animal to keep him company, is there some sort of positive reinforcement work I could do to help him gain confidence at being on his own? I followed the Willing Equine, and I remember seeing a post on Adele helping a horse through positive reinforcement gain confidence being on its own. If not through positive reinforcement, do you have any other suggestions? Some solutions I've considered are bringing TiVo down to the barn with Nate and I, but TiVo is uncomfortable with being haltered, so taking him out of his paddock isn't an option right now. It's something I've been working on. I've also given some thought about asking one of the other boarders if they would try keeping their horse in the same paddock as mine, but I personally don't think any of their horses would get along with my horses. Um, I don't want to not ride Nate because TiVo is uncomfortable. Okay, guys, let's not knock things over on my desk. Stop it. Get... Okay. <laughs> um... But I don't have any other ideas aside from getting another companion horse animal, which isn't a fe feasible option. Thank you. Okay, so I have a couple thoughts. Um, number one, great that you're following Adele. Like, she's a brilliant individual on the subject. Um, but another one that you could follow in addition is Fair Horsemanship. Um, Elise, who wrote uh, Humane Science-Based Horse Training, uh, which was the first positive reinforcement book I ever read, so I owe her <laughs> a ton. Um, she has opened her online courses, and they're essentially recorded webinars, but they're really good. And um, I just did her one on separation anxiety, and that is what you're dealing with, Kate. So I, it's, I think it's 20 bucks USD, I think. I, I want to say it's 20. It could be 35. I don't know why that number is also in my head, but I'm 90% sure it's 20 bucks. Um, so maybe save for that and give that course a shot because um, I found it really helpful in learning how to conceptualize and why horses are the way that they are with things like this. And, um, you know, I saw a quote on Facebook the other day that, um, and this isn't what you're saying, but it just helped me think about this a little bit more that um, when you see your horse as an animal that's doing something wrong, you're more likely to devolve into punishment. But if you see that your horse is struggling, you're more likely to actually help them understand. So that's why I think that the separation anxiety course is a really good one for things like that. <clears throat> because then you're like, oh, okay, I get it. This is totally normal. I understand why you're behaving like this. And let me see if the, there are things I can do to help you. And Elise provides a lot of them. But um, in short, it is practicing successive approximation. And you slowly get both horses used to being apart. So even though Nate doesn't have an issue, maybe you um, 
leave Nate in the pen and then take TiVo out. And if Nate's just chilling, then you can slowly start working TiVo further and further away. But if haltering is not an option, uh, maybe that's something that you do once it, once that's, um, oh my God, sorted out. So, um, you could try things like enrichment toys. Like they make these little, I don't know what the shape would be, hexagonal, I guess, octagonal little balls that have a hole in them and the horses push them and treats fall out and then they, that's a good time. (laughs) So um, you could do that you could try setting out alfalfa flakes. And if it's just too much for him still, like if the food isn't going to keep him busy, you could um, just slowly, you might have to involve another person, but slowly start taking Nate out and then just having somebody, you know, just be there to comfort TiVo and um, then put Nate right back in and then gradually increase the time and then gradually start increasing the distance. But when you increase the distance, you have to reduce the time again. Um, So you're only changing one thing at a time. So like don't, don't have Nate out of the paddock right outside the fence for 30 minutes and then take him far away for 30 minutes. Um, So slowly start working up, changing one thing at a time to get TiVo more used to it. Um, You know, the the best option would be to have like a trio in that pasture. Um, I I don't know the horses at your barn, so you could have a very good reason for not thinking that any of the other horses would get along with yours. But um, you know, it might be worth a shot for the welfare of your horse. You know, um, if they share a fence line, you could set it up to where they share a fence line for like a week or so, and then you know, maybe you lead the the new horse around to the other side of the field and they get to see that horse from that side. And then you slowly start introducing the horse into the field um, and then, you know, merging them so that they would be more likely to get along. Um, But yeah, I mean, there are things that you can do in that regard. Uh, And honestly, I think that would likely be the easiest thing to do because when they have a buddy, then they're more likely to feel safe and less anxious. So um, that would be the option that I would shoot for. But, uh, you know, you could also do the actual training. Um, Another thing you might account for is ulcers. If this horse has had, um, you know, a not so fantastic background, then it's possible that he is mildly or chronically stressed. Um, and that can also perpetuate anxiety. Cause if you think about it, if you are a herd animal that has been hardwired for millennia to <laughs> be terrified and running all the time and, you know, being ready to flee from predators when you're injured to any capacity, there is, um, there's even more anxiety because you're like, oh, well, I have to be on extra high alert because, you know, my ankle hurts and I need to have more of a heads up than I would otherwise. So the same thing applies to ulcers, you know, any amount of pain or distress or something that puts them at any sort of disadvantage will likely produce more anxiety in them. So, um, you know, maybe look for ulcers and see if um, that is a thing. Um, but I think that is about all I have for that question. I highly recommend the fair horsemanship course again. I think it'll really help give you a better idea of what's going on and, um, some practices that you could do. Um, but I really think, you know, maybe if, if none of that works, the last thing I would do would probably be, you know, just take a week off from riding Nate and dedicate that same time to getting TiVo really comfortable with the halter and really, really working on it and making sure that you guys have a positive association with it and that he is now looking forward to it. He's doing it on his own. And uh, then you can start doing some of the procedures that Lise discusses in the those videos. Um, but yeah, that is going to wrap up that question. Um, question number two comes from Chelsea Reedy. I think. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce your last name. Sorry if it's not. Um, Hi, Jill. I followed your journey for a long time since your venting YouTube days days, and by sheer confidence switched to positive reinforcement around the same time you did. Oh, sheer coincidence. Um, I live in Perth, Western Australia and have recently taken on an 11-year-old gypsy cob thoroughbred cross gelding named Harvey. That is an interesting (laughs) combination. Um, But Harvey sounds like 
like the horse I'm picturing, Harvey sounds like the perfect name for him. <laughs> um, Harvey's story. His breeder brought him as, bought him, oh my god, bred him as a sport horse, but sadly passed away when he was four. He was put out with a herd until he was nine. I don't think he had much human interaction in those five years, and at nine he was sent to be backed and sold. Unfortunately for Harvey, he was sent to your classic cowboy breaker, and I have seen videos of his original sale ad, and increasing negative pressure was used extensively. He was definitely forced into doing things he wasn't comfortable or ready for, which makes me very angry and sad. So there's a video of this twat cowboy riding him back in onto a float. But why, you ask? My guess is to try and stroke his tiny ego and prove that, that he terrified this poor horse so much that he could make him go on a float any which way he pleased, any pa even backwards. I think that is a really good way to put it. I don't think I've ever heard anybody put it like that. But when I think of like Clinton Anderson, like prove that you terrified the horse so much that you could make him do something that the horse would never dream of doing. Um, you know, instead of like, oh, he respects me so much. It's no, you've, you've terrified him enough. Um, you know, we always conceptualize it like that with cases like that, but not, not so bluntly. So I appreciate that. You Australians. <laughs> I love it. Um, Okay, continuing reading here. My friend purchased a very shut down Harvey sight unseen as he was in another state. He was sold to her as a quiet riding horse. <laughs> Wrong. He was trucked over and got very sick with pneumonia on the journey. They almost lost him. I suspect he had horrible stress ulcers too, probably. He eventually arrived and was terrified and angry. He was striking and turning his hind end at anyone who would try and catch him. It took my friend three hours to load him uh, to take him home, and the trucking company refused to catch and load him to take him to the original drop-off point planned. He was put out with my friend's horse uh, for a gelding to re or for a year to recover, and has now developed severe separation anxiety. Don't blame him. He has. Uh, we're just on separation anxiety today, aren't we? Sorry, I haven't read these yet. I I wanted to go through them before, but oh, you were getting the raw reaction. <laughs> um, I don't blame him. He has learned that bad things happen when he leaves the safety of his herd. I met Harvey and actually swapped a little gypsy uh, cross gelding I had for him. I knew that he needed help and that positive reinforcement was the way to do it, so I agreed to swap. That is incredible, dude. Go Chelsea. <laughs> um, the first time I met him, he would repeatedly, repeatedly back up to you and have his tail, to have his tail scratched. Apparently, it's a gypsy cob trait, but he would almost do it in a loop when i tried to move him he was so anxious that he that we had to keep his paddock make oh my god paddock mate outside the float where he could see him and if he thought he uh had left he would start rearing and drag you i was using food rewards and zero pressure just rewarding any movement forward after about 15 minutes he calmed down a lot and was walking right on to eat but i didn't even attempt to shut him in since he was nowhere near ready we called it quits on that session uh, as to end on a good note, it was at that moment I wondered if I had lost my sanity completely and why I had swapped a much quieter, albeit very blank slate, for this guy. Um, after we decided to keep him in his own paddock, oh my goodness, this is long. You weren't kidding. Um, she started the the message with, sorry for the long one. Okay, hang with me, guys. We're almost, we're almost, mm, I'm lying. Um, <laughs> um, it's, Okay, I want to say, though, it is really good to have this much information because it's, it's it makes it so much easier to be able to suggest things without having to run the gamut of, like, okay, try this and this and this. So, um, okay. After this, we decided to keep him in his own paddock, but where he could still see his friend, so that the separation wouldn't be quite so much of a shock when we ended up moving him the next week. I ended up having him mildly sedated the day to move him off property so that he did not injure himself in the process. It was not a fun time for all involved. This was in late October. We managed to get him safely to the property I keep my horses at. It's a large sheep grazing property on 80 acres of hills on honestly an equine paradise. He is now paddocked with 12 other horses in a herd, and they are free to roam the 80 acres. That's incredible. Um, I didn't ask anything for, of him for about a month and simply let him settle. I would go out and feed him carrots, start teaching him the basics of clicker training and just hang out with him. Trying to counter condition a human's presence is something to look forward to. Um, and he has had his teeth done a few weeks after arriving as well. My other gelding who I have now sold was being done too. So I was able to keep him settled. That brings us to current day Harvey who I've been spending, uh, time going with my cats um, every few days to give him feed and a brush. It's summer here in Australia, so it's super hot and the feed has dried off. Um, okay. We, I'll, oh my God, I'll drive out to find them because 80 acres of hills and walking. No, thanks. He has learned to follow the car back at a trot and canter 
to the paddock we have at the bottom corner of the property, so I'm able to separate him from the others to feed him in. The rest of the property is just one huge open paddock. It's usually a mad race of me trying to drive through the gate, get out, run, close it behind us, uh, as the others knows, know what we are up to and follow in a more leisurely trot walk. Uh, this is when the severity of his separation anxiety becomes apparent. Even with the herd in sight literally hanging their heads over the fence, he'll still pace over the gate and back a multiple times during his meal. If the herd doesn't follow us down, he will eat but very anxiously with multiple breaks to check the gate in between mouthfuls. And as soon as he is done, he gets he goes to the gate to be let out so that he can return to them. I never force him to stay longer than he wants, and if the herd aren't there, we'll leave the gate open so that he can leave the gate he can leave when he pleases. Um, by the time I drive up to leave, if the herd are grazing at the top of the hill near the front gate, he will spot the car and come trotting over as if I just haven't fed and seen him. It's almost like his brain does a reset as soon as he reunites with the others and can calm down. It's quite bizarre. My previous gelding, who was also trained uh, positive reinforcement, uh, didn't want me, didn't, what? Didn't want to know me after being fed, uh, but I always rewarded him with whatever treats I have in the cars, I always want to encourage him approaching me. Um, you mentioned a course you had just done covering separation anxiety. I can't remember which podcast you mentioned it in. This one now. Um, I guess I'm just looking for tips to help him with this. I've never encountered separation anxiety this bad. I don't have any plans to ride him in the near future, if at all, but I'm more concerned about being able to take him comfor comfortably away for things like farrier, chiro appointments, etc., so that I can start working on float training him. In case we need to evacuate due to fire, it would be super handy. Uh, if I could feed him with the herd or off to the side, but we just get mobbed because food and hungry horses. Uh, I would appreciate any tips. He is the sweetest guy when he's calm and happy, which makes it all worthwhile. Chelsea. Okay, so this this one is a bit of a tricky question to handle. Obviously, there are the options from the, um, the last question to try, um, but it's, it's really tricky because of the setup. Uh, and I wonder if it wouldn't be possible to, um, like, I don't know what you have available to you, but I have a bunch of plastic T-posts that, um, you know, you can just, like, stick in the ground and pull up, like, it's very easy. Um, and I've got some cord or rope that I put around the top. So I can have a little round pin, so to speak, set up anywhere. So... I wonder if it wouldn't be possible to try something like that. You might have to get, um, you know, maybe a stronger <laughs> rope, but um, that way you could just kind of assemble and disassemble as necessary and set up something temporary to where you could go work with him out in the middle of his field with the other horses until you get a little bit further along with him. Um, and that way you could keep him comfortable and also, um, you know, get your training done. Um, the other thing to do is to like maybe throw some hay or some alfalfa right outside of the little area where he gets fed. And maybe if there's a super chill, like older horse that just hangs out and won't be all over you, maybe you could bring them in with him. Um, so you have two horses in where you feed him him and the other horse and, uh, you know, put a bucket of feed out for the other horse and a bucket of feed for him. And, um, then just do that for a couple of days and just let them out immediately after. And then you can slowly work up to maybe the other horse has like a flake of alfalfa to munch on and you can just like hang out with him and feed him treats, not asking any, anything of him and then just let them out. Um, so it's really low stress, low expectation, and you're slowly working up to being able to um, work in there with him. Um, and the other horse is just hanging out for companionship sake in case the others leave. Um, so those are a couple of options. You could do the same thing if you had them in the temporary fencing. Um, you know, just having them getting acclimated to it and realizing it's not that bad and it's okay. They can leave, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky because, you know, you you have to be safe. But you also don't want him getting run off from the other horse's um, or from you by the other horses because you've got snacks. So, um, that's probably how I would go about it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a really inconvenient setup to be frank. Uh, I, I don't know if it would be possible to work on developing some sort of paddock situation so that it might be a little bit easier, but I think that would probably 
be a big ask of a barn owner, but um, if they would be willing, that would be the ideal situation to maybe just put another paddock right next to the one where you're working um, so that you can have two horses in each paddock and then you can slowly fade out the other horse and then slowly fade out the horses being right there and then you can get a little bit further and further. Um, another option is if you had a friend, you could both work with your horse your horses at the same time in that field so that he would still have a buddy and maybe not be so worried. Um, so yeah, another thing is I would definitely treat him for ulcers because like I said with the last one, you know, all of that, like a 20 minute trailer ride can give horses ulcers. So, um, if you think it has been a really stressful (laughs) experience, it has almost certainly given him ulcers. So, um, yeah, I hate that that is such a short response for something that, um, was such a long ask, but I mean, really there are only a couple things that you can do. Um, and I would really recommend taking Elise's course so you can maybe get some more ideas because it's, it's hard for me to, to really be able to suggest a lot of things. Cause that sounds largely an environmental issue. Like <laughs> the, the farm setup is the issue and it's hard to brainstorm without being able to see it. But, um, hopefully that gives you some ideas and that is, somewhat helpful. Um, so thank you, Chelsea. Uh, next question comes from patron Nicole. We are in question three of what did I say? Six, I think. Um, so sorry, burp. Um, (laughs) Nicole writes, hi, so I accidentally left the app while writing my message. So this is my second go around for this. Oh my God. I am so sorry. That happens to me all the time. And I hate that. Um, (laughs) my name's Nicole. My horse is whiskey, a 15 year old Palomino appy. Go ahead and use names and pronouns. Awesome. Uh, This will be a long one, so please don't kill me. It is not as long (laughs) as the last one, so it's fine. Um, And the last one was also fine. Um, So to begin, I'm about two weeks into my positive reinforcement experience with my horse and everything is going pretty decently, especially since Whiskey is a cookie monster and will do anything for food. Uh, That you got the first, (laughs) the first challenge out of the way is making sure the horse is willing to work for food. Um, So far, we've worked on manners, targeting, and a little bit of reteaching him how to lead. He lives at the barn that I've worked at for five years now. So it was given to me um, and was given to me by barn owners. Oh my God, by barn owners a year ago. The issue I'm having before I can really continue working with him is he's not a very relaxed horse. He has his moments, but they're very few and far between. He has a history of being around people that never listen to him, and it's created a lot of problems. He's not uh, high strung in the way that he doesn't move around a lot and never snorts at things, etc. The way he shows his anxiety is via aggression. Example, pinning his ears, biting, balking, just flat out refusing to do what's asked of him, which is fine. He's actually being a good boy by telling me that things are wrong, but the problem is uh, whenever I want to work with him, he's constantly on top of me, and it seems very difficult for him to contain himself. For example, when with manners, he shifts his head around and isn't relaxed. Uh, to try and help with this, I decided to go out in his pasture and hang out with him. Previously, this has not been a very good experience for us, meaning he used to pin his ears and try and bite at me if I got close to him, but I would also, but would also do the same thing if I tried to walk away. But since then, one of the owners helped me by taking him to the arena and popping him in the nose and scaring him into being obedient. So, uh, he's got that in his head now when I go out into his field. Um, so it's not as bad anymore, but once he finds out I'm not going to hit him, he goes back to pinning and biting. Um, I've had all of this in mind when I went to hang out with him today and what happened is he wouldn't leave me alone. He was just super mouthy. Um, he would try to bite my hands. I tried doing Warwick Schiller's thing of rubbing the mouth and that just got me bit and then go for my legs. To me, he doesn't seem relaxed and I just don't know how to stop him from being so mouthy. Um, I think I'm going to pause here and kind of talk about that. And then, uh, she has some more questions here that I'll get to. Um, but I, I saw the video of Warwick Schiller and I really think I, I know why he says what he says. Like, if you're not familiar with it, um, he was talking about girthing up a horse and that when they try and nip at you, um, or like just a nippy mouthy horse in general, that if you just like go up to them and acknowledge them and, you know, rub their mouths and everything and just give them some attention and then continue going about what you were doing, then they're fine. I think for some horses that might work. I, I could name a couple that I think that would probably work with that I have worked with. Um, but I don't, I don't think that he, I, I want, uh, okay. I want to believe that he didn't mean that when your horse is actively pinning their ears and biting at you, that 
you need to just rub their mouth and it'll go away. I don't think that's really what he meant. I hope not. Um, when I first saw that video, that was the first video actually that I ever saw of him. And I was like, this guy is insane. What is he telling people? No. Uh, especially with the girthing thing. Cause I was like, that is not, um, no. <laughs> Biting when you're girthing up a horse is a sign of pain or remembered pain almost exclusively. So, um, yeah, but since then I absolutely love him and I adore his podcast. So I'm glad that I pressed on a little bit cause I was like, Oh my God, no. <laughs> um, but I, I like, I understand his logic behind it, but I just don't, th I mean, it's better than just like smacking them. So I appreciate it in that regard. But like you said, some horses it might just get you bit and that's not okay um so um I have more thoughts but I'm, I'm gonna read your questions okay it's my dream to just be able to go out in his pasture and hang out with him and pet him while he eats but that's just a no-go for him um so first question how do I help him with the tension and unbearing anticipation he feels when I do positive reinforcement work with him um so this is where those long questions really do come in handy because I'm not sure what the situation is like where you're working with him because if it's in you know his stall and there are other horses next to him uh that could be causing it it could be that um you know he's feeling some separation anxiety and that's why you're seeing it or it could be because he's used to um a lot of aggression and he just has associated that any human near him is gonna end up with some aggression being inflicted on him so um you know, how do you help him with that? So assuming he's in a paddock with other horses that aren't really going to bother you, uh, ideally you would be able to work with him in protected contact for a, for a while. Um, this is what I had to do with Mac because Mac would bite and um, that was not a fun experience. And we just had to start out in protect protected contact and we had to do that for a while. Um, so over his fence you know, working on targeting and manners. And you you need to be very diligent with a horse like this. Um, you know, he's not bad or anything, but there is that element of anxiety and then the element of the danger from the aggression. So you need to be diligent in your work. Like, I think that anybody could, could do this, but only if they're going to really pay attention and do the work. So what I would do is I would get a journal and write down your plan for the training session. You know, it doesn't have to go exactly the way you've written it down, but I would, with a horse like this, I would not just go out and just guess. So, um, work with him over the fence or his stall door or over the arena fence or something, but somewhere where if he gets aggressive, you can step away. I know it's inconvenient. And when you have the dream of just being able to like snooze out in the field with your horse, it's like, mm, I don't want to do protective contact though. But you, the only way that you can get there is by doing this. Um, because, I mean, if you just decide that you're going to go lay out in the field with him and it'll just happen because of bond, you're going to get hurt. And I, I, I just, I know that mentality and it, it sucks. But um, the reality is this sounds like a horse that's afraid to me. And, um, you know, it, it, you can't just insist on a bond. I'm not saying that you are, but I think some people might. Um, so I think it would be best if you were able to work with him in protected contact, wherever that may be, preferably somewhere that he's very comfortable and can leave at will. Um, but you know, where he can hang his head over the fence and work with him, but get a journal and write down your criteria and how you're going to progress to increasing. So when you work on something like targeting, are you going to start by clicking for when he touches the target or are you going to start by clicking when he looks at the target or flicks an ear towards the target or moves his nose towards the target or takes a step towards the target? What, what are you looking for? And define that first because with a horse that deals with a lot of stress and anxiety and uncertainty, especially when it is related to fear, um, you need to be really sure that you're clear. Um, sorry for the poetry, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have to be really sure that you are clear on what you're asking, because if you aren't really sure what you're asking, your horse has no idea. Um, and if you have ever had somebody clicker train you, uh, and if you haven't done that in your clicker trainer, I highly recommend doing that. Having someone clicker train you and vice versa is a very eye-opening <laughs> experience. And, um, 
it, it shows you how difficult it can be when somebody's not very clear on what they're, what they're looking for and how they're increasing their criteria. So, um, with, with a horse like this, like I said, you know, start, start from basics, start in protected contact, uh, work on something like targeting. That's very simple and easy and straightforward and present it and click him for looking at it. Click him for moving towards it. Click him for touching it. Click him for taking a step to touch it. Um, you know, put a cue on it, say touch and hold it up and then, you know, whatever, be sure that you are completely removing the target out of sight when he touches it. Um, that way, uh, you know, you are actually cueing it and, um, then you can start working on things like manners, but manners is such a tricky one because, um, if you don't teach it well, then you can end up with some issues. For instance, a client horse I was working with, um, when I first started working with her, um, she would, she developed a superstitious behavior is what we call it in the industry. (laughs) Um, where, um, you know, we had her in the little round pen and I was working with her over the fence and I would tilt my shoulders away and she would go to the center with her head and I would click her for it. And then I would, um, treat. However, (laughs) she started looking like, say I'm on her left side, she would start looking right. And then she would come back to me and then I would turn my shoulders away and then she would go to the center. I'd click and treat. And then she started turning right every single time. After I would click and treat, she would turn right. And I was like, "Mm, I've done this. So if you think about creating clean loops, you, whatever you are, okay. So whenever the horse is existing, it's behaving. Even if you aren't asking for anything, the horse is always behaving. And if you remember from the series that I did on like positive reinforcement for beginners or at the very beginning of this podcast, I talked about how cues are tertiary reinforcers. So when you cue a behavior, you're actually reinforcing whatever is happening right now. So think about it as, you know, you're going to your friend's house and you want to be let inside because it's very cold outside. Um, so you ring the doorbell and then your friend opens the door and then you go inside. So if the doorbell didn't do anything, like say the doorbell's broken and you ring it and then your friend opens the door, you're going to keep pressing the doorbell, even though it doesn't work because you think it did. So, um, a weird analogy, but I think that explains it very well. I hope, um, that that's what ended up happening with this client horse. So, um, I think it's really important that you're aware of things like that with a horse like this, because you're dealing with the element of danger and uncertainty for both of you. And I'm not saying this to make you like afraid of this horse or anything. I think it's absolutely workable, but, um, you know, I do want you to be careful and, um, not get injured or the horse get injured. So, you know, work in protected contact and write out and define in the smallest, most simplest of terms, how you are going to go about this behavior, um, training and, you know, work in really short sessions and be, um, generous with your treats. So when he does something, feed him a lot all at once. Um, there's an episode, a few episodes back when I did, uh, patron questions, um, and a girl was, um, uh, you know, dealing with a nippy horse. Um, and she wrote me back and said that, um, she didn't realize she was actually dropping her hand when she was feeding him. So she was lowering it and he was almost having to chase the food and that created some anxiety for him. And when she started thinking about actually like lifting it up, you know, not shoving her hand into his mouth, but just while he's eating, think about lifting it. So you're not dropping. Um, that helped him a lot, um, to just feel like the food's not just going to disappear out from under him. So, um, think about things like that and make sure that you really have an idea of what you're doing. I can't stress that enough with horses that are anxious or nervous, having even more ambivalence in the training because clicker training is already tricky. You know, the horse is having to guess (laughs) the whole time and you're telling them, Hey, you're going in the right direction, but they're still having to guess. And it's very exhausting mentally. So if there's an element of confusion or they don't really know what you're asking, it gets even worse. The same thing goes for traditional training. You know, if you're not really clear on what you're asking, the horse is just like, Oh, I don't know, but I don't like this. (laughs) Uh, I'm uncomfortable and I don't know how to make the pressure go away. Um, the same thing for, you know, uh, positive reinforcement. They're like, I don't know how to, how to get the treat. This is frustrating. Um, 
So anything you can do to minimize frustration or anxiety by um, making sure that he gets a lot of food. Um, you know, like with my client horse, when she is in a stall and we're working with her, um, you know, the stall is where she gets fed. So she's usually a little bit more anxious when we bring her in. So when I first start working with her, I have to feed her a lot for doing very simple things. Like we just target and I give her like three handfuls of food for just targeting once. And, um, after she eats a little bit and then she's like, okay, I don't have to panic anymore. It's coming. I'm going to get it. And then she's good for the rest of the time. So, um, you know, just think about things like that. And, um, you know, I would, I would really stress working in protected contact until pretty much until you see the ear pinning going away. I mean, like if you have to lead him and bring him into a stall, you know, do it. But, um, when you are training him, I would work in protected contact until you're seeing a horse that lights up when he sees you and is like, oh my God, we're going to do something fun, you know? Um, but yeah. Okay. So more questions here. Um, okay. Well, I'm just want to make sure that I answered the question. How do I help with, uh, tension and the unbearable anticipation he feels when I do positive reinforcement? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just going to have to be, I would say primarily defining clearly for yourself what you're asking of him and how you're going to work through your session. Like seriously, write it out like a play by play. Um, because until you get really good at doing it on the spot, that's, that is the best way to force yourself (laughs) to actually sit down and think about it. Just take five minutes, set a timer on your phone for five minutes and write through what you're going to have him do. What happens if that doesn't work? What happens if you, if he starts getting aggressive, what are you going to do? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to cover there. And, you know, this might be one of those questions that's better for, um, you know, a phone call type situation, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm answering it to the best of my ability. It's just, it's hard to know without seeing the horse, um, in cases like this and the, the paddock situation one from the last question. Um, but okay. So she says, my second question is how can I get him to be more relaxed when I'm around him to where I can just sit with him while he eats? So that's, that's going to be the same thing. Um, you know, right now you're probably not going to be able to, I don't know the horse and I don't know your situation, but I would, I would be willing to, to bet that that's probably just not going to happen right now. So you want to set your goal of getting him to enjoy working with you. So you have to prove to him that you're not going to be somebody that's going to hurt him and you are going to bring good things with you. So when you go out to see him in his paddock or in his stall and you just start working with him and it's always a very clear training session, um, it's very clean cut and there, he never has to be like, okay, well, is she going to feed me or what's happening? And if you ever notice him being like, okay, I don't really know what's asking. I'm getting a little agitated. I can't get it right. You need to back your criteria down. You've asked for too much. So on average, you want to be reinforcing like every, I don't know, when you cue something, you want to be reinforcing with in almost like five to 10 seconds. You want it to be that easy at the beginning. And when you reinforce, reinforce a lot. Um, And yeah, so once you develop that trust and trust is earned, you can't just go out and, you know, everything be fine when he's had his, you know, 14 years or 15 years proven to him that humans are not trustworthy. You have to prove to him that you're not going to hurt him. So, um, you know, just every time you see him, just work on it. And um, eventually it'll probably take a couple of months, you know, depending on how he is. But, and it could take weeks, it could take days, I don't know. But, um, you know, if you really get good at being clear and deliberate and eliminating as much frustration and worry as you can in your training, then you are going to have a horse that will enjoy you being around them. And, um, you know, I know because it's tricky when you just want to go hang out with them in their paddock and they're like, I don't trust you. And it's not your fault. You didn't do it. But, um, you know, unfortunately, you're dealing with um, the remnants of somebody else's mistake. So, um, you know, just once you develop that trust and that bond and he starts associating good things with you instead of those powerful old memories, then, you know, it, it might take some time, but it'll it'll happen. 
I have confidence in that because, I mean, you clearly care about this horse a lot. Most people dealing with a horse like this would not justify him and look at him the way that you do. You know, it's clear from the way that you write that you are really, um, you know, you have a lot of compassion for him. So I would say, you know, you're on the right track. It's just going to take some time. And I know that sucks. It's a bad answer, but <laughs> it is it is the reality. Um, but... There's another uh, question here. I feel bad because this question is basically, how do I get my horse to leave me alone? Um, I have a few ideas on how to fix this, but I want your opinion. My main idea is just going out and hanging out with him in protected contact. Yes. Um, that way I can move out of the way easily if he tries to bite me, but I still don't know how to fix the mouthiness. Um, I have a feeling he'll just figure out he can't reach me outside of the protected contact and get frustrated. You're probably right. And then I actually go into his field and go back to biting and never leave me alone. I can't do any positive reinforcement work uh, in his pasture as per the barn owner or request I work with him in either a stall or the indoor arena and there it is <laughs> um okay uh she also said thanks Jill I love your podcast and I'm a long time listener I've been reading books and doing quite a bit of research thanks for the inspiration you are welcome um so yeah I mean it's it's inconvenient if you can't work with him in his pasture um but I wonder if you could work over the pasture fence uh, if not, the stall would be fine as well, but I would not just go hang out outside the fence. You're in doing so you're essentially forcing yourself on him without anything in it for him. You know, um, he's like, I don't know. I just, I think of it like if this horse has been abused and is uncomfortable and you just go out and you stand with him every single day, it's kind of like, um, you know, he's like, uh, I don't know. Eventually there would have to be some sort of contact or, um, you know, scratches or pleasant experience for him to, for him to start warming up to you. Um, I should think, but it would go quicker if you were able to use some positive reinforcement. So you could do the stall or the arena, as long as he isn't, um, uncomfortable or anxious, um, in either of those settings. Um, cause I mean, like if he's in a stall or if he's in, in a stall by himself in an empty barn, you know, that might contribute to the issue as well. The other thing is check and treat for ulcers. Um, almost every horse that is aggressive in any capacity has ulcers. So those are my thoughts. Um, question number four here comes from patron Bella. Um, she writes, Hi, Jill. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for any spelling and grammatical errors. I'm from Denmark, so my English is my second language. No worries. Um, my name is Bella. Uh, I don't mind you saying my name. Um, recently, the past year or so, I've gotten really into positive reinforcement as it aligns much better with the way I'd like to work with horses and animals gen in general. I work at a dressage stud where my boss has allowed me to work with the horses through positive reinforcement. It's been really great and I've seen clear imp improvements with a lot of my work, so I definitely want to continue with this method and learn more. Recently, I encountered an issue and I've reached a point where I just don't know how to proceed, hence this message. My boss owns a six-year-old miniature stallion headliner. Headliner has always uh, decided displayed a specific reactive dominant aggressive i'm aware those words aren't uh, accurate i just don't have the correct language for his behavior yet no worries um aggressive is probably um correct specific reactive aggressive behavior um and when it occurs he rear strikes and runs towards whoever's working with him backing up towards people and frequently bites or nips he was the only one or i was the only one working with him over the summer where i found the behaviors decreased we could go over long walks and jogs without any aggressiveness in october a girl began stalling her horse at our facility since then she's been working with headliner a couple times a week as i've been have quite a busy schedule with school and the other horses his behaviors have increased drastically without my knowledge and resulted in him rearing up striking and hitting her <laughs> oh my god he does this at all times when being handled i'm at a bit of a loss i worry if i move forward without knowing what i'm doing i get hurt further distance myself from headliner or even frustrate or confuse him by doing something wrong he has had a full workup by the vet he's out in the field next to other horses from dusk till dawn and he has had access to uh hay and water Sadly, he can't have a field buddy as he is very aggressive towards other horses due to the lack of socialization at a younger age. I have discussed the option of gelding him, but my, my boss is not interested that oh my god, is not interested in this as she wishes to have a full from him. Sadly, I really can't go against my boss's boss's wishes. I wish that preventative measures could have been taken, but I think headliner's behavior has been brushed off as cute or p playful from for a long time since he is so small, 31 inches. How tall is that? I think that's I don't know, like maybe hip height for me. Um, 
I'm so bad at estimations. His behavior has always been there, but a change happened. At this point, it's dangerous to be around in my heart. It breaks my heart since he is such a lovely character and I feel my boss is beginning to lose hope. I also wanted to note that I'm not faulting the girl. She's lovely and just wants the best for headliner. Lastly, I'd like to thank you for your lovely work listening to the podcast and among other resources you've recommended it has completely changed my perspective upon my time with horses. I've always been very uncomfortable working traditionally and been scolded by trainers for not being aggressive enough. I feel like I finally found a training method that fits me. Keep up the excellent work. I love the podcast. Much love, Bella. Much love, Bella, indeed. Um, so, yeah, I'm like picturing this gigantic stallion and <laughs> it's a little little pony. Um, but nonetheless, he still deserves to be treated like a, um, you know, a horse that is struggling. So if I were you, I would have a conversation with the girl that worked with him and inadvertently... Um, created this issue and find out what she did. Um, you know, the why isn't always so important, but especially in a situation where the horse is, uh, dangerous and dealing with some aggression issues and you're kind of on a tight timeline here with the owner having some issues with him. Um, I would say that finding out the why is going to take you to the how a lot quicker. So if you figure out what what exactly she did, maybe when she was leading him, she hit him with the end of the lead rope or she elbowed him or something. And now when he's leading, he's wary of, you know, one or two of those things happening. Um, and that's why he's reacting the way he's reacting. So um, I would say probably if you can talk to her and just be like, can you just like walk me through what's what you've been doing with him and what he does and then what you do? And you know, like I wouldn't really try to correct her um, or anything and just hear her side of the story. And if she asks for advice and give it, but otherwise probably, I probably wouldn't. Um, and then, you know, if you have time and are able to work with him, I, I would ask your trainer if she would be open or your barn owner or whatever, um, if she would be open to letting you take over his training, um, so that you don't have the problem or the issue of other people dealing with him and kind (laughs) of ruining your progress. And then you can show his owner or your boss what, what you're doing with him that's helping him. And then that way you guys can work together to help keep his training going in the right direction. So, um, for this, it's, um, it's a little bit tricky because I don't exactly know what he's doing other than rearing and striking. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said in the last question, those are the best ways to sort of work with it is essentially just proving that you are a good human that is not going to hurt him. And you might have to, when you feed him, feed him in a pan, you know, Like if he touches a target and you click and treat, toss the food into a pan instead of feeding from your hand if you're worried about getting bitten. Um, But just going back to basics and proving that you're not going to injure him or harm him and that he has no reason to be defensive. And it it does take time. I mean, you're working through a trust issue here. Um, And I mean, I think it's totally workable. It sucks that he has to be by himself. Um, You know, I would be trying to make sure that he's not developing ulcers. Um, And if you could have at least where he can see other horses, um, that would probably help a lot as well. And just spending as much time with him as you can, working with him and helping him, um, you know, gain more confidence and be more comfortable to where you can get back to where you're able to go on those walks and jogs and things. Um, But uh, beyond that, I mean, like, I think if you work at it, it sounds like you're diligent enough. I would start in protected contact and just kind of move through things and getting to, um, you know, just the basic behaviors. And it's not really so much about the behaviors in cases like this as it is um, in the classical conditioning that happens. So, like, teaching him to target is not going to tell him to not be aggressive. What it does, though, is help him understand that being around humans is good, it's fun, it's clear, he gets to use his brain and do something that's really interesting and fascinating and earn treats from it, and the human's pretty cool, too, you know, like, um, so that is the classical conditioning aspect, but if the training is aversive, if it's confusing or frustrating, then you're working against yourself, so, um, 
you know, I would, I would go through that and, you know, have a conversation with your boss about like when she wants to have this full (laughs) and see if you can't like push that along a little bit and then get him gelded. Um, because I know it's, it's rough on horses, but at the same time, it's, it's just better for them because like the way we treat stallions is not okay. Like isolating them and everyone expects them to be aggressive. So, you know, they become aggressive because people treat them as if they're going to get injured all the time. And, you know, that's fine, but not when the horse is, you know, becoming aggressive because he's been only handled as if he were aggressive. Um, but I think that is pretty much what I've got to say on that topic. Um, every one of these questions seems to be kind of an offshoot, if not nearly the same question as the last one. So, um, those are, that's two separation anxiety and two aggression questions. So, um, let's get into number five here. Patron Julia asks, hi, Jill. So I have a very specific question for you. My nine-year-old off the track thoroughbred lost his left eye in June. This has made me strictly positive reinforcement, or this has made strictly positive reinforcement almost impossible. Thus far, moving away from pressure is a pretty vital, or is pretty vital since, oh my God, since his field of vision is so limited. I also ride using mainly negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement has helped us in a lot of ways with ground things like manners, tying, haltering. The issue I've run into is that when I'm not training and simply tacking him up to ride or changing his blankets and might not have treats on me in that exact moment, he puts his head away wanting a treat and then gets frustrated and tries to nip at me when I don't give him one. Other people handle him at my barn and don't necessarily understand what he's doing and assume he's being rude or mean. I'm wondering if you have any ideas to combat this behavior without abandoning positive reinforcement and using treats altogether. You can answer here or on the podcast and you don't have to make my name anonymous. (laughs) Um, I also think that um, I might have to clarify that he's not pinning his ears and biting as though he's upset. It's more of a mom pay attention. I did my trick. Where's my treat kind of nip? So um, the very, the very first thing I would say um, is... Well, let me read the rest of the question. I just wanted to thank you and give sort of an update, I guess. Anyways, my training pony is the one that was taking food weirdly and was a little food anxious, and I listened to your response. Oh, this this is the one that I was talking about from the last question. Okay, sweet. Yeah, I knew that I read this somewhere, um, but okay, I'm going to read this for the sake of... Who was it that asked that question? Bella. Um, okay, uh, I just wanted to thank you and give you sort of an update. Anyways, my training pony was the one that was taking food weirdly and was a little food anxious. I listened to your response and tried doing the thing where I sort of pushed the treats up towards him when I'm feeding, and that helped about 80% of the time, which was awesome. I hadn't even realized that, but I was totally, uh, totally used to move my hand a little as they take it. The other thing I did, and no, you've talked about this before, but I started feeding him like multiple handfuls each time, especially right in the beginning because he gets a little excited when he realizes that we're training, and it seems to help him chill a little bit. Also, feeding him when he's still chewing it makes him have to take it with his lips instead of his teeth this combined with changing the way I feed him has helped so much. So actually I think that was for, um, Nicole perhaps, um, can't remember exactly which, which question that was from, but, um, that was the response I was talking about. Um, okay. Anyway, so back to your horse with the blanketing and the tying and negative reinforcement, things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it does sound like a, Hey, I'm a little aggravated with you. Where's my treat? Um, So the first thing is you can do your sessions with scratches, assuming he doesn't have ulcers or any sort of um, muscle sensitivity, things like that. Um, So maybe here and there you just, you alternate between either using treats and scratches, um, but be sure that he is understanding. Maybe you could use a different click and um, something like that, or you could um, just have a day where you just like go and you give him really good scratches, find his itchy spots for Zoe. It's like right on her withers, right at the base of her neck where her neck meets her chest. That is her favorite spot. And uh, anywhere on her haunches is her favorite. So um, finding places like that, um, that you can reinforce them for, you can cue them to do things and then do that. Um, So you could give him lots of scratches. And then, um, you know, with the people at your barn, if they halter him, just be like, he really, really likes scratches. So when he does something right, look, it'll make his lip do the funny thing. So if you could give him scratches, that would be great. Um, And kind of making it like a game. But also, I would have a conversation with them and say, like, be straight up and tell them, I'm training my horse with positive reinforcement. Please do not um, read his behavior as rude. He um, has been trained to expect a you know, a reward for doing something right. And when he gets the blanket put on or his halter put on or he leads quietly next to you, he's expecting that you're going to reward him. 
So, um, you know, if he gets a little bit agitated that he's not getting a reward for being a good boy, um, please don't punish him for that. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm working on it. And hopefully we'll get to the point where the activity itself is reinforcing. And you don't necessarily have to give him a treat. But, um, you know, in the meantime, if you wouldn't mind just giving him scratches, that would be great. Or, um, you know, have somebody else do it or let me know, whatever. Um, and, you know, having a conversation with them, like, what is the specific instance where he's doing that? Um, how is it bothering you? Would you be open to trying this? You know, just being straight up and like trying to work with them. Um, that's what I would say. Um, I would work with, um, scratches a lot, you know, with the baby horses that we have. I like Azula. I never train with treats. I don't need to because she just is a fiend for scratches. Um, so there's that. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, it's annoying when you're trying to do something and you're like, oh my God, I'm in a hurry. I don't have treats for you. And they're like, what the heck? But they don't know that you're on a tight time schedule, you know? So, um, you know, being diligent about allotting time so that you're being fair to your horse and not creating frustration. Um, and also like getting them used to you just doing things and, you know, maybe they just get scratches today. Um, or maybe they get some treats dumped in their bucket. Um, or alfalfa pellets dumped in their bucket or something. Um, so those are some things that you can do, but yeah, I don't think you have to absolutely abandon it. You can just, um, swap out reinforcement if you don't have any on you. Um, also thank you for the update. Um, okay. So next question comes from patron Bonnie. This is our last question and we're only at an hour, man. I am breezing guys. Um, okay. So Bonnie says, hi, Jill. I have a trick, qu uh, trick training question. Quick training question. Um, Big Red hates having his ears or his pole touched. So his bridle path hasn't been cut for a long time, or when I do manage to cut it, it always ends up being a bad experience for both of us. Sometimes he's completely fine with that area around behind his ears being touched. Example, put his head on my chest and fall asleep getting scratches there. But as I try to trim his bridle path or even put a halter on that has to go over his ears or simply touch that area, he will become a giraffe. Ears go wide and head goes up. It's difficult to take it slow uh with him as i am also f it's difficult to take it slow with him as i am also five foot and he's 17 too so when his head is up high i struggle to get him to relax and just rest my hand near his ears um i have a good idea of how i want to start w through positive reinforcement but i want to see what you think p.s the ear shyness is happy besides he's okay so not an ulcer thing um this is uh the client horse that i mentioned earlier about the loopy training thing um has this issue also. And I am 5'8", and she is probably 16 hands or so. So um, I don't have the height issue, but it's not an issue because um, you, you definitely can take it slow. Um, I just want to give you confidence in that regard because you, you can. Um, I You said you struggle to get him to relax and just let me rest my hand near his ear. Um, to me, for a horse that has a fear issue or a remembered pain issue or a current pain issue about that area, that is, you're doing too much at once. Um, you're lumping and you're skipping a bunch of steps. So what I did with my client horse was, um, you know, it was a rainy day and we've been working on trailer loading and so I couldn't really work on it cause it's outside and it's in the rain and it's very cold. <laughs> um, so we had her in her stall and, um, you know, she's hanging her head out the door and I'm working in protected contact and I would just stick my head, my hand up and she would, you know, flick her ear towards it. Like, what's that? And I would click for that. And then I would hold my hand up again and she'd flick her ear again and I would click and then remove my hand and feed. Um, and I repeated that a lot until I, um, started gradually increasing the criteria to flick and move towards me. Um, and then eventually I taught her to ear target by doing that. She'd just get closer and closer and closer until she was touching her ear to my hand. So that's the difference. You're giving the horse the power. You're not touching them. They're touching you. And now we've gotten to the point where she'll target her ear and we can close our hands around it. She's still a little bit funny about it sometimes. Um, you know, if I ask for it and... I immediately close my hand around her ear and then she's like, mm -mm. so I, I'm not entirely convinced that there's not a pain issue going on with her, but, um, she's, she's just kind of finicky about it because, um, you know, you could slip a bridle over her ears, but you can't slip a halter over her ears. So I don't know if that's because she's focused on the bit, 
um, that's in her mouth when you're slipping it over her ears and it's kind of distracting from it. Um, you know, it could be a myriad of things or she just has a bad association with a halter, but not a bridle. So, um, horses are very good at reading context and they understand things are different in different settings and with different pieces of equipment and things. Like when I walk out in the paddock with Zoe and I don't have my treat pouch on, she doesn't expect a training session. So, um, those are some things to consider. Um, I would first get him checked for, um, you know, an issue in his ears. TMJ can cause horses to be really sensitive in their ears. So having, um, you know, a Cairo or a body worker out, um, and making sure that he's good in that regard, because again, you can't train through pain. Um, that can be really helpful. Um, but breaking down the ear targeting even more so that it's not a, I'm going to touch your ear and you have to develop a good association with it. Um, you're allowing the horse to come to you and put their ear in your hand and you don't have to, like with, uh, the client horse, when I first started, I would just hold my hand out and when she would put her, she would touch her ear to my hand, I would click and treat. And then we did that a bunch before I started like asking for a little bit more time and then I would click and treat. And then after that, I would see if I could, you know, bend my fingers around her ear and touch her ear like the back of it, and I would immediately click. I wouldn't ask for time. And then we gradually work up to more time with the fingers closed and things like that. Um, and the other day, I was standing there um, waiting on the girl's mom to hook up the horse trailer. And, uh, you know, we were just talking, but I was working with um, the horse and just clicking and treating for her putting her ear in my hand. And the girl mentions that she's a little bit, um, you know, sensitive in her pole area. So, um, <laughs> then I just started working on that and I would just, you know, see if I could hold my hand out. And then when she moved her head, um, I would touch her pole and click and treat and vice versa. And since she already knew the ear targeting, she caught on it onto it really quickly. And cause the pole is kind of a difficult area to target. So at first it was kind of like where her forehead meets her neck. So that, that little knot at the top, which I guess is technically their pole, but I consider where the bridal path is to be their pole. Um, so things like that, working on getting them to present those body parts that they're uncomfortable with to you. Again, if it's a pain thing, that's not a fair question to ask. So, um, yeah, I would say that that's how I would go about that. And then once you've got that down, you can start having an object in your hand like scissors. And so, you know, maybe you ask for the ear target and then you have scissors in the other hand that you just hold up and then you click and then you keep going from there until you're able to, you know, touch the scissors to their neck or, or they target to the scissors. Um, and then you can make a little sound up there, but I would go back to not touching and making sound. Um, and then you can start touching and making sound and then you can have your other hand up there and pulling the, um, you know, their mane up as if you were about to cut it and, you know, just break it all the way down. And each time you introduce something, go back a step on the other thing that you just got good, you know? So, um, that is how I would work with that. Um, those are always fun questions for me because I'm like, Ooh, we get to actually like break something all the way down. <laughs> um, but I think that is how I'm going to answer that question and I'm going to leave it. So I hope this was helpful for you guys that ask questions and all of you guys listening. Um, hopefully it made you think about, you know, going about training some issues differently. Um, you know, I apologize if the answers <laughs> separation anxiety is really the most difficult one to, um, to talk about because it is such an ingrained part of a horse that I kind of have an issue being like, should we really try and fix that? Um, and is it really bad that the horse d is anxious away from his buddies? Would that keep him safe? Um, so, you know, like, I don't know, I kind of have some wishy-washiness personally with that, but, um, Anyway, I hope this episode was helpful and you guys enjoyed it. If you would like to keep up with me and the horses on other platforms, you can check us out at Jet Equitheory and Equitheory on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, and check out the podcast website, equitheorypodcast.com and jetequitheory.com for more resources on positive reinforcement as well as other educational topics about horses and my story and my horse's stories and all that good stuff. Um, with that, I am going to dip out of here. So be sure to subscribe so that you can keep up with us and I will see you guys for next Tuesday's episode. Adios. Adios.